Thank you, Marta. Um, and uh, thank you guys for uh, having me. Um, I guess I got a good slot since you don't have a workshop after this. Everybody's going to be pretty happy that this is the last talk of the day. Um, I hope it's the last talk. Of the day. I mean, is this echoing? It kind of echoes. Is that OK? Cool. All right. Um, despite the kind of heady title here, I actually mean this to be a, a fairly light talk. I, I wasn't given a whole lot of guidance, so I hope it is at least useful. If it's not, that's OK. You can just kind of eat and look at the floor, and I won't be offended by it in any, any stretch. At this point, you probably want to look at anything other than somebody standing up here talking in front of you anymore. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do is uh, kind of give you some perspective that I have over kind of like a 20-year career doing HPC co-development, particularly in the realm of like managing defects. I'm not going to get into like the heavy, any kind of heavy domain science, and I'm going to try to keep this light and easy. Um, if anybody has any questions or want to jump in, feel free to do so. Um, and let's just uh, dive in. Uh, first of all, I thought some ground rules. I think I've already covered the first point, so you know, you're, I won't be offended if you guys are just exhausted. I know I would be, so feel free to, for, to just you know, stare at the walls or stare at your fork. I, I don't mind. Um, one thing I want to lead off by is that I, I don't like to proselytize on anything. You know, people hear like software engineering or software practices, and it's like, oh god, somebody's going to tell me how I should be doing things. What I'm going to do is tell you some things that our team does and has been doing that have been pretty useful for us. If you like it, cool. If you don't, say thank you and go on your way. Again, I'm not, I'm not offended. Um, I stopped proselytizing a long time ago when I was kind of a, a young naif at a, at a lab not to be named right now, not where I currently am. We were in a meeting and um, I was really excited. We were talking about some, some kind of cool stuff we were doing to what we thought would improve uh, the quality of some of the scientific software we were writing. And uh, there was an older fellow sitting, sitting there just looking really, really disturbed. And um, I, I said, you know, you look really upset about this. What's, what's the deal? And he says, we did this already, and the project was killed because we weren't making progress. So we said we were never going to do it again, and this is ridiculous. And I, I asked him, I said, well, was this recent? You know, when, when did this happen? Because I would have thought, you know, to me, of course, being young and fairly recently out of school, I assumed that everything interesting in computing had only happened within the last two years. And, um, and he said, well, that was in April 12, 1973. <laughs> and, and then I realized, well, People take stuff like this pretty seriously. So I don't ever try to tell anybody what to do anymore. By the way, that was in 1999. So it wasn't like that was in 1975 either. I'm not that old. Um, I'm going to try to keep this short, not as short as I wanted to, because when I looked at the schedule, the schedule actually said that you had a full hour for dinner. I was like, God, they don't want to listen to me speak for an hour. So I'll try to aim it at like 40 minutes. And then I noticed. And this kind of gets to the title of my talk, a, a defect in requirements that um, I actually noticed in the original invitation, they said, oh, well, they eat, and then you talk for 30 minutes. I said, oh. So I actually have more slides that I need. So I may rip through some of this or just skip it. But um, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to try to keep this pretty light and easy. Um, again, go back to item one if you think I'm speaking too long. Um, I don't like to do like manager clip art or like sliding images or things that pop in and out of the screen. So if, if you need that, um, again, you know, go back to item one. <laughs> OK, quick outline. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a kind of a conundrum. I, I don't, I'm trying to get a sense of the field. I'm guessing most people here are kind of graduate, postdoc, early career professionals. Is that about right, mostly? OK, cool. Um, you know, one of the things that's a real challenge is kind of managing, you know, if you're in computational science, you know, is managing your research, discovery, and your software development activities. This is going to be kind of one of the big conflicts you have if you stay in this field of endeavor for, for probably most of your career. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. I'm going to talk about three things we do to help manage that. I, I call this um, the complete development life cycle. I kind of like that. I made it up two days ago. Um, the name, not what we do. Um, then, and then. Um, uh, unit testing, um, designed by contract, and then a kind of a summary. So that's, that's kind of the rough outline. But 
let's you know talk about you know research and H, you know HPC code, right? So you know your challenges. How do you manage you know these big, complicated, multidisciplinary code projects? You know, with the act of you know scientific discovery, you know, your people will say, well, I'm interested in the physics, or I'm interested, you know, as if by writing a line of code you somehow created physics, but. Uh, be that as it may, how do you kind of manage this give and take? And so, you know, I posit something, you know. So consider you're, you're working on a new algorithm and you're implementing in a big multidimensional parallel code. Now, you know, in these days we always think about those things. You know, back when I was starting, you know, lots of computational science was done in universities. You know, you started with, you know, every student came in, you wrote your own little 1D code to look at some numerical, um, some numerical aspect. You know, we're kind of way past that now. Everything now is, you know, Parallel scaling, uh, multidisciplinary. So you're you want to put something in there, and you know you do all the great analysis, and you say, oh well, theory predicts that that thing should be should give second order convergence. You know you do your you put it in there. Your computational results are first order instead of second order. And the first thing you say is, well, of course, because nothing ever is really second order when you actually do a real problem. But but after that, you say, why is that true? And the real quandary is this: is this a bug? Is it an error in my initial analysis? Where did, where did that come into play, right? Did I do the analysis of the system wrong? Did I implement it incorrectly, all right? So in my feeling, you know, in my general way of thinking is that, you know, a certain amount of software engineering and methods um, research aren't, only, aren't just compatible, they're really essential, all right? Um, I actually came out of an experimental background um, and I never met an experimentalist worth anything that couldn't walk into a lab and set up an oscilloscope or set up an you know AD converter or anything. I mean they knew their and they took their lab skills very seriously. A lot of times in the early part of computing, a lot of us, you know, you probably heard it, some people are almost proud of the fact that they do a really bad job writing code. Right? You know, you may have heard it, you may not. If you haven't, that's good. Things are getting better and I just need to get out more. Um, but in any case, I think these two things aren't in conflict. They really are important to work together. And this is doubly, triply, quadruply true when you're talking about multidisciplinary high performance computing code. All right. So what I'm going to be really focusing on from here out um, is, is what I call software verification. That's kind of this general thing is like, you know, we like to talk about how we, you know, we do good numerical analysis, we prove things, we have tools like Fourier analysis and things like that to prove something like convergence. We talk about verification of models, we talk about validation of physics at the computational level, but do we ever really talk about verification of the actual software that's doing these things? And that's kind of, kind of where we're at, and the idea is to, I, to remove defects at code construction time. Um, I don't know about you, I make tons of mistakes when I write code. I pretty much, every line of code I make, I probably make like two mistakes. And I realize this every, you know, I realized this a long time ago. So the idea is how do I still be productive knowing, you know, that when it comes to actually writing the code, I write it, write it, rewrite it, and I'm kind of a klutz that way. So how do I, you know, get better at that or do something that keeps myself from just quitting and jumping out of a window? So. You know, if you go back to the definition, software quality engineering is really the practice of managing the cost and quality of a software product. You know, and that, the guys in that hall are probably, that's all they're talking about, cost and quality and stuff like that, right? So I want to come out, you know, what's a guiding, there is a guiding principle if you look at a lot of software engineering research, um, such as it is, and that is, is that, and this is really common sense, but maybe you haven't thought of it, is that, you know, the cost of, any, of de defect resolution really increases with time from defect introduction. In other words, if I ask you to write a diffusion solver and you go away for nine months and write a second order transport solver and come back, that's a big problem to fix, right? Because you did the wrong thing, okay? So, you know, whereas if you started on day one and I said, no, no, don't write, don't write a diffusion, a transport solver, we want a diffusion solver. Oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So this is really pretty obvious, but you tend not to think about it, right? And, and generally, as in all complex systems, things, you know, entropy pervades and things tend to fall apart, not come together, right? So we have defects all over the place. We have defects in our model development. We have defects in our algorithmic selection. You know, how many times have you seen some piece of code that's performing really poorly because they put 
an order n search instead of an n log n or, an n or log n search or any number of things like that, right? And um, defects and requirements are really big, especially in scientific computing, um, and of course, defects in implementation. You know, there's lots of different ways to mitigate defects, so this is not the Bible, okay? This is not the end all be all. This is not what you should do in lieu of anything else. All right, I'm gonna talk about the three things I mentioned at the beginning. Again, every time I read it, I like that more. The complete development life cycle, um, unit testing, and, and design by contract. It's not exhaustive, you know? Notably missing, and people love to talk about it, reviews. Are you doing reviews? You do reviews, have you reviewed that? You know, reviews are awesome. Yeah, we do them, they work. I, I'm not gonna talk about them the rest of the time, okay? Um, the whole point is, but using a set of practices, what you really can do is help to catch these defects before they really become a problem. All right, um, requirements, as I mentioned right at the beginning, um, requirements can become a real problem, especially in soft, scientific software where we don't necessarily know the solution when we're going to implement it, right? Because we, we posit a hypothesis, we say, okay, this is something we think can work, or we posit a model. And we're working on the model, and then we start running problems, we start learning more and realize, oh, we have the wrong model, or oh, we're missing some terms, or, or what have you, or this method is second order and we really need something higher order, okay? Or this method is second order, but it's too expensive, we really need to be running something lower order, and our accuracy requires that. So things are constantly changing. So obviously, agility is very important, but one of the biggest things is that I don't know if you've noticed, but actually a lot of times in scientific environments, we really are bad at communicating, all right? And that's doubly true with software. Because when I ask you for, you know, a lot of us are really good at saying, hey, bring me a rock, okay? And somebody brings them a rock, and you say, well, I didn't want a gray rock, I wanted a black rock, and that one's, you know, that one's a rhombus, and I wanted something rounder. We're really good at that, we're really good at saying, bring me this, and criticizing what you were brought but we're not so good at saying what we actually want. And this is really true inside of software. You know, a lot of times you're putting stuff together and you, you know, people are talking at crossway, crossways and not really communicating. All right, so, so let's get, dive right in here. Like I said, I, I thought of this phrase literally two days ago, but it's something we've kind of been doing. Again, something kind of common sense, but something we've been doing for a long time, and, um, and that is on our team, each developer is really comp is responsible for the complete implementation of a feature from requirements, derivation of methods, numerical analysis, through to construction and deployment. Okay, um, again, I'm gonna go back to a former life at a lab I'm not gonna name. Um, this kind of came down to the fact that uh, there was a very important code there that was largely largely run and written by one person. And it was very successful code, so I mean, there's all ways to make things work. Um, he had a habit of not really documenting or commenting anything he did, so on the rare cases that people were actually trying to get in there and, and work, they had no idea what the heck any part of the code was. And um, they actually, and this is a true story, posted an internal job ad out for someone to comment his code. And I couldn't think of a better job for just out of, you know, graduated PhD, getting in a big national lab and saying, hey, you're gonna go comment this guy's code for the next two years. <laughs> That's gotta be about the worst thing in the world. All right, so, you know, from that day on, we decided, you know, and, and it was easy for us at the time, I was part of a, a two-person team, so we kind of, by, by definition, had to do all these things because there was nobody else to do them. But the idea is even on a big team, we kind of stepped away from the idea that, oh, well, this guy derives the methods and then he hands it to this person and this person, you know, implements it and then this person, and then we give it to a testing team. And having said all that, that doesn't mean that those schemes don't work, okay? You should always do what works for you. This often works for us because then each person has to be kind of take some ownership of each area, and generally the final, we found the final product uh, to be better. In particular, at deployment and usage, you know, one of the other problems that often happens in scientific computing is we write a lot of code. How many of us actually run the code we ever write, right? You know, it's hand off to a bunch of users or a bunch of analysts or a bunch of scientists, and then they're not speaking together. So it really is very helpful to actually run the code you write at least once in a while. Okay. Unit testing. Um, I'm going to spend a, a little bit more time on this. You may have heard some talks on unit testing, testing in general. What I'm really focusing on here is testing at the software level, the software verification level. Um, 
And then, again, for the purposes specifically of, um, of software verification, and the idea is that to ensure that each part of the software perform its contracted task. All right, um, there are two kind of design paradigms that really, I can't believe I just used the word paradigms there, um, that really help you uh, with, with unit testing. That is if you have something, you know, acyclic code design. In other words, the associations are always directed as opposed to two-way. It becomes very hard. How many times have you seen or worked with some piece of un, you know, effectively unstructured spaghetti code? And it's impossible to test and find anything because this subroutine calls this one, which goes back and has a call back into this one. And you can't separate or, or separate anything and actually build up some sort of comprehensive testing to see that is, you know, is A doing what B requires, what C requires. All right, and then design by contract, which we'll get to a little bit later. All right, and in, um, in our stuff, in our kind of our standard edit, compile, debug workflow, we actually uh, practice a method of unit testing where we're actually writing the tests right alongside when we're writing the actual code itself. Okay, acyclic code design. So this is actually real code from our particular application. Um, I expect you to read and remember each and every word in there, but other than that, the whole point of this is not to care about what's in the boxes, to simply know that there's no two-way dependencies. In other words, as I'm gonna illustrate here, that there's, this is built up piecewise. And, and it, this not only helps from a testing and development standpoint, it also really helps you just from a, from a deployment and build standpoint. You know, doing things like forward referencing and everything else can really make your build process very cumbersome. So when you have a hierarchical acyclic design, it's just gonna make, yourself, make your life much easier. All right, so let me give an example by what I mean by all this. Um, I hope this, this works out okay. Um, it's hard to show you know, actual lines of code, which I'm going to do here. But anyway, so um, I work in the area of computational nuclear engineering. Um, and so I'm gonna show examples from that area. I could show examples from other areas, but then I would look like a fool, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, so here's a typical problem we have, you know, we, this is, for those who don't know, it's not a funky looking eyeball. This is actually a, a top-down view of a nuclear reactor core um, where basically all those little dots in there are, are fuel rods. And so these are the types of things we're modeling. These are kind of both engineering and science simulations. So looking, um, we have lots of different ways to calculate the uh, neutron transport through this reactor, which is a paramount part of, of understanding the physics of how they work. I'm just gonna show this to motivate the examples that follow. So this is kind of a blow up of one part of that. Again, the little, the uh, magenta uh, things are actually the, the fuel rods. They're basically sitting in a big pool of water in this array in, environment. But you know, we can send by, we sample a starting neutron. This is a random process that we're using to calculate the history of neut uh, neutron flights through a reactor. We sample a distance to a collision. We calculate a distance to the next physical boundary. Then we take the smaller of those. In this example, it's a collision. We, we, move the part we basically move the particle of that collision. We uh, tally its particular state. And then we kind of continue a random walk throughout the core. And we do that many times and do it in a statistical ensemble of all the paths, and that's how we calculate the neutron state of the reactor at a given point in time. So um, the little part of the code I'm gonna show here is this geometric representation. Why am I showing that? Because it's really simple, and this part is an export controlled, so I don't get in trouble. So, um, so we can think of that first level. Again, here we have an acyclic design that defines this geometry, which allows us to model uh, the typical structures in a reactor core. All right, so we start, the lowest level thing is that thing I call there, that RTK cell. RTK, if you're curious, means reactor toolkit. Awesome acronym there, I like it a lot. Um, so the whole point is, here's a simple diagram where I have a class hierarchy of stuff that I wanna test. All right, and the first thing is, starting at the lowest level, can we write a, we can write a unit test that unambiguously tests that object because it has no other associations. Again, that comes back to the, the acyclic part. There are lots of frameworks, by the way, that support this. Uh, we use Google Test and have our own slight modifications to it. Uh, I, I, I know Mike Carew was here earlier who, who leads the Trilinos Project to Sandia. They have something called Tufos Test. There's, there's, and there's many, many, many more 
Um, it's not real hard to roll your own of these, although I, I would recommend using something that's available just because it's not something you have to maintain. Um, and uh, some extra details are always required to support advanced architectures. But let's um, kind of the old fashioned way when we didn't have to worry about things like GPUs or fees or, or mix or anything like that, um, you could basically te test, uh, set up a simple test harness, um, say, okay, I'm going to do a bunch of hand calculations, you know, and say, okay, if I start a particle here and I want to move it here, then this gets to this point, this point, this point. Am I calculating the correct distance to boundary? Am I initializing it in the right state of the geometry, et cetera? So we make a simple test. We say, okay, here's, here's, a, here's one of those little pins. I initialize it with a particle in a state, and then I basically make sure I'm doing garbage in, garbage out. This is all, all pretty obvious, okay? But the point is, um, you can actually put something in there, it becomes part of your standard repository. I'll explain how that's beneficial in a little bit. Um, you know, we put our hand calculations, we actually use Jupyter Notebook. Before that, we used just old fashioned Python scripts. Uh, and those sit along right inside the repository. So if these tests get updated or want to be extended, you can always do that very easily. Now, things get a little bit trickier when you want to do something, for example, where you're programming on a GPU or on a GPU and you're using CUDA or any of the layers that support things like CUDA, whether it's Cocos or, or any number of things like that. Um, and that is because you kind of want to have your, your executable has to be a standard .cc file, and you kind of want to isolate, generally, and it's a good practice of design to uh, isolate the device code from the standard CPU side executable code. So in this case, we still use our standard harness all right, but now we have to kind of make this bridge between them where we actually, we actually build the, um, the test harnesses in a header file that can be included both by the CUDA file, .cu file, and our initial test file. So this is doing the exact same thing the other was, but we kind of have to split up the code a little bit. And then there's another final little piece, and that is because, for example, CUDA, or any of these implementations generally do, don't support these testing frameworks or the, um, the inheritance required that most testing frameworks are built on, you end up having to do some, jump through some hoops. So what we often do is we take the exact same test, but instead when we launch our kernel, what we do is we pass in kind of these empty vectors and we fill them up and then we bring them back out the other side and then we check the conditions on that vector. This test is doing the exact same thing the other one does, but you end up having to jump through some extra hoops just to uh, support the on-node, on-device uh, implementations. So all of this works, you can do it, and obviously we do this in both parallel and serial and message passing. Um, the nice thing about this is it's fully integrated. We use CMake. I don't, you know, it's easy enough. Before CMake, we used to use uh, the Auto Tools environment, and you can do it just as easily there. Uh, adding tests are very easy. That we, you know, so they're fully integrated through through your CMake environment. So you can run C tests, and it'll run all the ensemble of all your tests. Obviously, you want to design unit testing at this level. You want to design to run quickly. Most of our tests run in a couple hundred microseconds. Up, some of them are up to a second, two to three seconds. These are not acceptance or validation tests. We have a separate category for those. I could give a second talk on doing that type of testing. This is really testing each class as you build it. So in some sense, you're not testing whether you've done the correct thing in the class. You, you're really testing is the thing that you think you coded doing the correct thing. So in that sense, it's true software verification. But this is not testing, you know, well, is my algorithm second order or is it you know, so it's not doing verification, and it's certainly not doing validation, okay? The other thing, of course, is that each of these, because it, you know, in, in Google, this is a standard Google test output. Um, the, it's very beneficial. We find it's very beneficial. We're writing tests as we're writing code, you know, so then as you're making errors, you see, <laughs> you see the problem. Um, I've actually done time, at times, I've actually, when I know the API that I want to write, I've actually written the unit test before I've even written the class. So I've actually written the unit test, and then once the test passes, I actually know I have a valid implementation. Okay, and then I'm not gonna go through this. I could walk through my whole code this way, and, 
everybody would be really bored and want to kill me and or rush out the door, one or the other. But the whole point is you can kind of step your way up as you go up these hierarchies. And the reason that is is that once I've already tested my lowest level class, I can say, okay, I know that works. I no longer have to worry about that guy once I go up to the next level. And I kind of work, just work my way up the tree. Okay, I think uh, enough on that. I'm gonna move to something else that you may or may not, but how, how many people are familiar with design by contract? Anybody heard of that before? One person? Okay, so, I, so you probably were all familiar with testing or unit testing in some form, so hopefully it was a little bit useful, or at least you got to, you know, stare at something for a little bit. But um, this is something that might be new to some of you, but we found it to be immensely useful, a useful practice. So basically what design by contract is, is it enforces a function contract by testing input execution and output of a function. All right. Um, design by contract was actually a, a phrase not just coined but copyrighted by Bertrand Meyer. Um, so the, hence the copyright standpoint in, in, the, in the real philosophy of open source. Um, people now often call this programming by contract and contract first development because nobody wants to put the little C subscript there. If you're really interested in a lot of the details and theory, so I know you're going to run right out of here since you have three free hours tonight and do this, um, you can look at advances in object-oriented software engineering, um, pages 1 to 50, test tomorrow. Um, and uh, if you're really curious about some of the inside details, but it's really probably not worth 50 pages of reading. He's very, he's very serious about it, though, I can tell you. Okay, um, implementation. Some languages, i.e. those experimental languages like Eiffel, has, has anybody even heard of Eiffel? Does it exist? Yeah, the one or two, yeah. So that, Eiffel was basically a, Eiffel was in the 90s, what kind of Pascal, is it, has anybody ever heard of Pascal? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pascal was like in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It was kind of a hypothetical, idealized, object-oriented language. But anyway, um, some of these actually had DBC built into the language. Um, it's not obviously built into C or C++, which is what we use. Um, we actually use, but it's very easy to implement using uh, CPP pragmas. For the few bits of Fortran kernels that of we, that we have in our code, which is very small. We actually use M4 to do the same thing. But the, uh, the types basically are require on input, check on execution, ensure on output. Okay, that probably means nothing to you because I put these slides out of order. I just realized and my example is after this. So we'll just hold on and um, we'll go to that right now. Okay, so an example. I, very proud of this highly manufactured example. So someone asks you to provide a routine to calculate square roots. Okay, as I said, this is pretty manufactured. Anybody asked you that, you should quit immediately and leave. Um, but being, being very clever and, and somewhat stubborn and just totally enthused with your own genius, you decide that I know how to do this. It's a nonlinear problem if I, if I phrase it as you know, the, the solution of, as the equation x squared minus x, s equals zero. So I can solve that with Newton's method. And voila, I come up with my awesome four line square root algorithm, okay, where somebody gives me s, I kind of go through there and, and lo and behold, that will give you the square root of some numbers. Um, I test it and show, yes, it converges quadratically. Um, I unit test it, so I give it a bunch of numbers, it works, everything's great. And all of a sudden, there's some real problems. So, some indiscriminate time later, as you've moved on to much more exciting things than square roots, um, you start getting complaints. What are the complaints? Well, John, is anybody here named John? Okay, I, that's, you're not, I didn't intend to use you for here. Okay, anyway, um, he spent two weeks tracking some spurious results down to your routine that returned a value of 200.514691. I actually wrote that algorithm to get that, by the way, um, for, for the square root of 40,200.25, which is greater than the margin of error and was causing all sorts of trouble. And he's pretty pissed off. Tara, she works for me in my group, and this is, sounds like something she would say. Are there any Taras? I hope, hope not. Probably not. Okay. Um, She's, using, she's doing a spherical harmonics expansion in, in complex space and threw minus 4 at it and got minus 4.8. So she's also pretty pissed because she thought you were better than that. 
um, you reply, hey, I wrote the routine, it was thoroughly tested, and it's been performing as designed. You know, I unit tested, it's running every night on our CI server, everything's good. So what gives? And pandemonium ensues. All right, so what's the problem? Well, this is really a defect from ambiguous requirements, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't know that somebody wanted it to be handle complex numbers. And just because no one told me requirements on what the precision should be, I thought, you know, giving us number, you know, within one e to the minus five was fine. No one said anything, right? How could DBC have helped? Well, let's, again, first maybe I made the decision early on that I'm not going to handle complex math. So I added my require statement right at the beginning that says that S has to be greater than zero. May not be what everybody wanted, but at least it's very clear what I intended to do. Right? Second, I'm also checking for tolerance at the end, and I'm saying that I'm going to say that my answer is going to be, is going to check to see that it's within some level of tolerance. Again, that may not be the tolerance other people wanted, but at least now I've made it very clear what the intent of my implementation would do. Okay, what's the moral of the story? Uh, clearly, that example isn't going to win any Programmer of the Year awards, but you kind of get the point. The idea is that Design by contract really allows developers and clients to codify these ambiguous requirements. Somebody said, again, this is, goes back, somebody said, give me a rock, you brought them a rock, but it's not the rock they wanted, right? And the thing is, is that language is, is by definition ambiguous, code by definition is not, right? So if you can actually codify the points of that ambiguity, and you can actually remove it, okay? Um, in particular, what's very useful about this, going back, especially if you have fancy highlighting in your editors, is that these statements show up really loud and proud inside. So when I'm reviewing code, especially, you know, we do code reviews, and before it's, you know, and I get a pull request to put code into the repository, um, I'm reviewing the code, I can go, these things shoot out immediately. I would immediately notice that, hey, wait a minute, this was supposed to handle complex numbers, and I can see that you don't, right? Or, hey, wait a minute, without looking in the middle, people tend to avoid the messy middle, right? They go right to the ends, right? So I can immediately see that, um, you know, that, that tolerance isn't what, isn't what people are going to necessarily want. So it really is helpful at re in reviews. And at no if nothing else, downstream, the, that we could at least always catch something that's been used, because these, basically these assertions file, file uh, sorry, they uh, fire an assertion. In our case, it's a C++ assertion that gets caught at runtime. So at least you, you know, can see when things are going wrong if you're using something in a way that was unintended. All right, so enough with hypotheticals. Do you actually do this for real? Because that's what everybody always asks. Well, that sounds great when you're writing square root. Do you actually do that for real? And uh, yeah, we actually do that for real. So we both have, these are actually our device-based assertions. Under the hood, they basically fire assertions that get caught by CUDA and thrown back to the CPU controller. Um, again, this is back to our example from before. And what this is really checking is some basic things. So obviously, so the, we're passing in a direction that's supposed to be a unit vector. So I could write a routine that takes a direction, but maybe I'm assuming, I could assume that it's normalized or I could assume it's not. This makes it very clear that I'm expecting to get a normalized unit vector on input to this particular function, right? And then it's testing some other things that consider that your directions are in a valid state. So for example, you can't be going towards both faces at the same time. That would be pretty bad, right? In the middle of this, of this routine, I'm checking certain things as part of a, as part of a, uh, as just part of execution. The beautiful thing about the way this is implemented, and I'll get to this in the next slide, is these are all macros. So when I compile this in production mode, they disappear. They don't even show up as symbols in the code. So I can litter my debug code effectively with as many of these things as I want, right? And it's going to incur no downstream cost at all. And then at the end, I'm making sure that everything I've done is valid, right? Um, if, I'm in a, if I'm tracking, if I'm doing ray tracing between different regions, I better make sure that my result is positive, right? Because something shouldn't go backwards, things of that nature. Okay, so basically, I can, I can litter my code with that. The other real nice benefit of this is it also serves as a really nice form of documentation. 
right? So when somebody else is coming in and modifying or using your code, they can actually, if you have these things well-defined and well-used, people can see exactly what they mean. So I don't, have to, I don't have to dig through your code to see, wait, is this, do I have to normalize this vector or is it already normalized when it comes in? Things of that nature. Very useful in parallel code execution where you have pieces of data decomposed in different routines, right? Because a lot of times what we do is we check the size of containers when they come into a routine, a parallel routine. Should this be decomposed locally or globally? Is this a global index or a local index? These are things that we often check inside of our, our uh, assertions and it provides a very nice mechanism for doc documentation. Okay, um, getting towards the end here, I've probably been already talking too long. So um, again, the purpose of all this is to provide software verification, is to really try to, to find these defects as close to their point of introduction as possible. That's really what this is all about. Again, this is not the only way to do it, but it's one way to do it. There are many different ways to do it. A really good way to do it is to just write bug-free code. Who, who's really good at that? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, there we go. I'm surprised, I'm surprised John didn't put up his hand over there. Okay. Um, so the other really nice thing about this, have you guys all heard of continuous integration? Know what that means? Probably by this point. Yeah, okay. So. Unit testing and having a rigorous testing framework is, is actually um, a sine qua non for doing continuous integration. Now you can do continuous integration without having every class in your code base unit tested the kind of the way we do. You can just do it based on a set of acceptance tests, but this provides a really nice mechanism for, for, uh, for, code integra uh, for doing continuous integration. Um, this is, we found this, and this is very germane to what you're doing here, Porting to new platforms, much easier, because how many times have you ported to new platforms or looked at new compilers, and there's some wacky compiler behavior you can't understand? If you have unit tests that really drive down in all your different classes, a lot of times your unit test will pick up that wackiness, right, and point you right where the problem is, as opposed to having it just pull, you know, if you just are relying on, on high-level acceptance tests and you're wondering, well, why are these results different, 1e to the minus 3, instead of being numerically equivalent? Right. Um, again, this is kind of related to porting, finding esoteric compile link time errors, which of course are never esoteric, um, especially on high performance computing systems, but nonetheless, when you're going on to a machine for the first time, usually you can figure out which piece of code is causing you the problem, okay, or is causing Cray the problem or IBM the problem, as it were. Um, again, I mentioned already, uh, this incurs no cost in your production code. You can litter your code with these things. They get, compi they get, they get, out, uh, they get compiled out in your production runs. So, I mean, the symbols don't even show up. Um, something that you may not be thought of, but something I've learned over the years, it's a lot easier to run your profiling, memory, and development tools on a small unit test than on your entire application, depending upon the size of your application. Um, if you want to look at some profiling or really want to look at some debugging of a certain piece of code when you have a really nice constrained single executable that isn't, you know, 120 gigabytes in size, your tool might actually be able to dive into it and handle it or look at it as opposed to trying to look at the entire application. Again, it's also an um, unambiguous statement of code design requirements. Um, if you're working in a team where you're constantly revisiting different pieces of code, to either make them better, faster, stronger. Um, you know, this really provides a nice sanity check on code refactors. Ideally, if I take something that has a search routine in it, my search routine is order n, and I realize I should have something that's log n, my unit test shouldn't, shouldn't change, except maybe get a little faster, right? But that's not really what you're checking this part is. So I actually can totally redo the implementation of a given piece of code and I'm not necessarily panic on the fact that I've done the implementation wrong because I have a test there that tests the actual input and output of the code. Obviously, your API changes, then your test has to change. But um, this is another thing that we do is we actually weekly run this and we incorporate timing data. So you can kind of actually get a runtime timing profile of your code history, which is sometimes useful. Again, if you go the other way and you had a log n algorithm in there and you snuck a log n squared algorithm in there or an n squared algorithm, uh, it probably will pop up, which is sometimes very useful. Uh, I mentioned about the usage documentation. Disadvantages, I have to be fair, there are always disadvantages. 
there is a cost to doing this, right? Because you are writing a lot of code that you weren't writing, okay? Um, our experience shows that that's about a factor of four to eight to one in writing code with unit tests, somewhere in that, in that range. That's not a scientifically verified or validated number, but it's, it's rough. Um, I, I also will tell you that that cost is minimal compared to the debugging cost incurred throughout a product lifecycle. Um, another story from previously mentioned lab, not to be named. Um, I know a code project that had, that basically had produced realistic but erroneous results for, for 12 years because of, a, because of a minus sign in one wrong place. So it had, been, it had been used for production scientific runs for 12 years and was somebody actually found a minus sign in the wrong, <laughs> in the wrong part of the code. Um, and uh, so that kind of stuff, you know, I don't know about you, it kind of keeps me up at night when you're writing this stuff. It's like, God, how much, how much crap have I designed based on, on the code that's just wrong? Um, okay, um, again, if you write bug-free code, congratulations and ignore all of this. You're, you're good. So if you're really good at that, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, some codes that are you know, legacy or that aren't structured according to acyclic design concepts, it may be difficult, prohibitive, or even impossible to really write unit tests in the manner I've described. Um, usually in that case, you kind of have to block off those sections in as best you can and, and just deal with it. Um, but if you're writing something new, generally you can do this. Um, the diff most difficult thing in all of this that I've found over the years, though, is kind of finding and abiding the 80-20 rule. Like, anything can be taken to extremum, right? So the problem is if you say, well, if I test, you know, is it my job to test every conceivable logical path through a class or a series of classes? And especially as you work your way up the, high, up the chain, you can have many, many, many logical paths. We generally strive for between 90 and 100% function point coverage in our coverage analysis of these things, but logical path we're nowhere near that, nor do we want to be, right? So you really want to try to find, and, and that's just general experience, um, you know, hitting the right edge cages, but you can literally spend all your time writing unit tests too, which is also equally unproductive. So finding and abiding by a, what I call the 80-20 rule really takes developer experience. And to show you that I'm not full of it, um, yes, we do actually do this. This is kind of a listing of uh, our application's test code. It's, it's written pri primarily in three languages, C++, Python, and CUDA. Um, obviously, the lion's share being C++. Um, roughly equal percentages of the lot, total lines of code, which is on the order of you know, approaching 700,000 lines of code, are test code and actually what I would call executable code. So that's kind of where that factor of four to eight comes from. About 5% of the entire executable code base are DBC statements, you know, and that's generally what I've seen historically over, over the years. Um, on our Python code, which is ma mainly driver, we handle, uh, we handle it in, in a different way, the DBC part in a different way, so it doesn't show up there. And then in CUDA, it's very, very similar types of percentages to uh, total C++. Okay, final thoughts. I bet you all very relieved on this one. Okay, just um, I, I kind of wanted one takeaway and one takeaway only, and that is, you know, the simplest thing I probably said, and that is, you know, the cost of defect resolution increases from time from the introduction. And if you kind of keep that one thought in your head, no matter what, pro and, and kind of design whatever process you use or your team uses or the team you're on uses downstream, um, with this in mind, you're probably going to be okay. You know, the longer something gets into your code base or into anything you're doing, the harder it's going to be to go back and fix it. Um, and remember, too, that this is kind of like when you see management, you lie bullet. Um, applying this principle does add some upfront cost, all right, which makes most people who are paying you run for cover when they say, well, it's gonna take a little bit longer because I've gotta write these tests. So you just don't tell them you're writing the tests. You just say, you're doing this, right? And this is what it costs, and this is what I'm doing. Um, the fact that um, our applications now have surpassed about 500 million hours of runtime uh, with about five or six actual failures at runtime on, the big, on big machines like Titan, Jaguar, and, and the like. So I can tell you uh, that this kind of stuff really does work 
and helps you reduce the amount of defects you have. And when you've burned a million hours because you've hit a runtime block in a code that's sitting there for 12 days, somebody's gonna get upset at you. So, so make sure, uh, you wanna make sure you wanna apply something, some process to try to, to manage your defects, especially in an HPC environment. I'm required by law to put all these acknowledgements sooner or later, we're probably gonna, all our slides will have be acknowledgements and nothing else, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother reading any of that, but, but they're there. That's actually all I have, so I'm free to take questions, comments, whatever. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? Okay, I will start. Uh, the three pi charts, how, what is the software that you use to generate this? I don't think it's a grad student counting the lines. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is two things. So this is actually, I use um, some COL, CLOC. It's, a, I, it's available open source for count lines of code. It's just a simple, it's about the only Perl utility I've ever used in my life, because I hate Perl. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, so that, that'll actually give you the output, and then what I do is I just, I just drop that into my, as a CS, I just output it as a CSV format, and then load it into Jupyter Notebook and use Pandas to pull this in, and then Pandas produces these lovely looking pie charts. By the way, this and budget things for managers are the only time I've ever used pie charts in my life, I should add as well. <laughs> Yeah. And one question, what well, is more a comment regarding your previous slide about the disadvantage? Yeah. So disadvantages I, or yes, yeah. disadvantages. Yes. So um, now you are PI of uh, an ECP project, right? And uh, it was the the length of the program was uh, from ten to seven years, so it was reduced. How much do you think that all the work that you are doing has helped you, in fact, in catching up and not stress in this reduction of time? Because I don't think that is really a it is true is that, that you have to spend time, but I don't see it like a real disadvantage. I think oh, it's more yeah. a requirement. I, so I, the, the disadvantages here are kind of um, are, are kind of tongue in cheek. Um, I don't see it either because the problem is, it generally, if you just again, unless you're just really really good, and there are people like that who are really really good at just you know dropping in a big piece of complicated code that just works right out of the box without any prior testing to it at all. Um, I found that, for example, I could, I probably wouldn't be able to write that stupid square root routine without probably messing it up once or twice without kind of testing it as I, as I went along. Um, so, you know, for me, we would be putting this multi-physics application together and we would spend the next nine months to three years debugging it, right? Whereas generally now we do it so it kind of works right as we get it together. That doesn't mean everything works. We still may have some of the wrong models and we still may have limitations in memory and, and you know, this isn't solving everything. But at least the actual bug type defects where you put something in there, it's like, God, why are these numbers not working or why am I getting NANs here? At least those things get largely cut out. So yeah, I don't view it as a disadvantage in cost at all. If anything, I think it saves cost overall. But it does put that cost is both the thing is, is, the cost is quantifiable, which is a good thing. You can actually measure how much time you're spending writing tests versus how much time you're writing executable code, right? Whereas searching bugs ten, for bugs tends to be less quantifiable in this sense, is that, I don't know, again, a lot of you all are new, a lot of times people will say, oh man, he delivered that thing in like four days. Now the fact that they, you spent the next six months trying to make it work because what he delivered was, was shit and it didn't work, right? <laughs> That never gets counted into that four days from you know then till ever it's it was four days, right? Whereas if you might have taken two weeks, but it worked right out of the box, it says, Oh yeah, well that guy did it in four days, he did it in two weeks. There's a little bit of that going on, and that's really what that's more about. But anyway, that's that's my response to that. Thank you. I would go further than you in saying that doing the test design as you're writing code is something that you should not be seen as an overhead for the simple reason that in any kind of sane development, you are implicitly figuring out some way of testing the code. Otherwise, how do you ever have the confidence that anything is doing the thing that you, you expect it to do? Mm -hmm. So it's just not formal in many of the environments, but you do tend to develop these tests. The idea is to keep them around. Mm -hmm. But the second point that I'm making is that this is a net you could argue this is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for having Oh, good certainly, code. no, I, this is not, 
this is not meant to be all encompassing. This is one yeah. part of right one because part of you, our st process. you still have to worry about interoperability among well, components and all yep. of the all of yep. that kind of thing that comes in. So we have a one of the things that um, that's really useful in the on the DBC side, for example, um, when it comes to coupling different code components together in the require, check, ensure process, we have a mode, so we can toggle any of those three modes on. So for example, you can turn off check, ensure, but leave require on, vice versa. So it works on just a, a binary bit switch. So seven is one, 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 all three are on. You know, one is zero, zero, one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, four and two. So you can figure out exactly what bits you want on. So we have a mode we call our paranoid mode when we're coupling to other codes. So we can leave all the requires on, but turn everything else off. Um, it's, it's really more like paranoid jerk mode because what we're saying is everything we do is correct if you give us good stuff, right? So, so it's a great mechanism for testing interfaces between different code components. It's obviously you're correct, 100% correct. It's not sufficient. And, and as I mentioned before, none of this is showing like, for example, necessarily performance. If I expected you to write something that was potentially that was supposed to be log n and you gave me something that was n squared, this alone is not gonna necessarily test that. So there's still a lot of analysis and testing in terms of performance and things like that that I haven't covered here. So I, I would agree with you for sure. It's not sufficient on its own. So given that this eventually saves you time in the long run, even though um, it, it might be more time in the beginning, um, where is the threshold for project volumes where this is mandatory to be part of the project proposal and why is it not mandatory for all project proposals at institutions yet? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I would say for this very similar reason that when you read a numerical paper in say Journal of Computational Physics or something like that, there's very little um, in, those, in those journals on like the actual code or algorithm that was put in there. There's just a historical um, I, I think there's still a, I think it's changing, but I think there's kind of a historical bias against the idea that this stuff isn't science. This is just the, you know, the day-to-day -day drudgery, right? The science is your very elegant mathematical method or numerical method and the analysis that associates with that. And so often, traditionally, at least in DOE, I'll go to my, my purview, okay? has not wanted to necessarily hear about how you're approaching software quality in that. That is changing. It hasn't changed to the level that you've just mentioned that, hey, can you tell us what your software quality is going, you know, requirements are? Now, what they are getting to are things, they are starting to move that direction with regards to data. For example, all DOE proposals now have to have a data management plan. I would expect down the road there's going to be something more like this in terms of how are you going to assure some sort of software quality delivery deployment plan, but we're not there yet. Then just a quick follow-up. What is your advice to us as the new future users to drive that forward also with respect to the institutions that have the money and the proposals? I think, I, I mean, I, um, that's, a, that's another really good question. I hadn't thought about it that way. I would say that the best thing is, I think these things best grow when they're grown organically. And that is, is that if most people are, are approaching their work this way, and if they're taking that, the construction of these codes is just as important as the numerical analysis and, and physics models that you're developing together, that creates a groundswell that these things are important. You know, computational physics is still, kind of the bastard, you know, third child next to kind of traditional theoretical science, experimental science, and then there's this kind of gray nebulous thing called computation, which, right, kind of has tentacles in both sides a little bit, but kind of sits on its own. And, but, so it, it hasn't, it's, you know, the standards of what computational science should be have never been fully, you know, fully fleshed out in a formal way. And, and you're starting to see that happen more now with, um, with, with journals that are providing code repositories so that you actually, when you submit a paper, you actually submit the code that produced produce the results for that thing, right? Um, you are starting to see some directions that way, and I think as, as we continue to push that way, those things will go. But I, I think, again, as a community of developers, more people feeling that this is important will we'll push this. When I first started, everything was about, you know, we used to call it kind of 
you know, dismissively hero code. I don't know if that's a phrase that's still tossed around. You know, it's like, it's, it's the one guy who, who writes it, and if anybody else touches it, it's like, get away from that, you know, and that kind of thing and all that stuff. I mean, oh, do you have time for one more kind of, I actually, another guy at, for the fourth time in the lab, I won't mention its name. Um, we went, um, I went up to see him, and he was working, so he had, his code was in 15 three ring binders on a shelf, right? And he was, and back, this is, and so he used this editor called like the, the, the friend, it was called Fred, which stood for friendly editor. It was actually a line editor written in Fortran. And the part of the reason why is because the code was basically one file and it was about almost like 800,000 lines, which back then was, was pretty big especially on one file. So, so you couldn't bring it up in memory in any kind of conventional editor. Um, so, but, but Fred could do it, right? So he, um, and he would have his binders, you know, open around his desk and, and he would kind of, you know, he had terrible eyesight and kind of a hunchback and he'd kind of look at this and then he'd go back to the key and I'm not kidding, he would do this. And he'd look back here. I mean, it was just like, I'm like, oh my God, this is what I'm going to be in 30 years? And <laughs> screw that. <laughs> and so, you know, so you tend, to, you, you tend to change, right? You tend to push things. And, and things are moving very fast. You know, we didn't have Stack Overflow or anything like that when I was, you know, back in even the late 90s. You know, now, now this stuff is being broadcast everywhere. So you actually have ammunition behind you. You know, you can go to any number one of these sites and people will tell you, this is really the way scientific software, software in general should be done, and there's lots of backing for it. It's not just, you know, young whippersnapper walks in and tells old guy with 12 notebooks that he's, you know, doing things wrong, right? So, so I think, you know, again, it's just the kind of a groundswell helps, helps these kind of things go forward. Also, as more and more codes are done this way, and they're deemed to be successful, in other words, they're producing good scientific output, they're being used by a broad community within a given domain, uh, that also helps go a long way. Because one thing that has, has kind of, um, I think, hurt the computational sciences, computational physics in the past is that people have come in and said, no, you guys are doing it all wrong. This is the way we should do it. And they spend, you know, years building these do-it-all frameworks and, you know, and, and all this stuff, right? And then they never actually deliver any code that works or anything that works even tan anywhere near as well as a legacy code, so they're very easy to dismiss, right? When you're actually producing real applications that are producing really interesting scientific output, especially on these new machines, um, you know, proof is in the pudding. And that's kind of where you, it's, it's kind of what I started earlier, proselytizing almost never works. Um, and anytime you generally go against the status quo in an, in an organization, you know, you can, you know, it's, it's kind of a cliche to say you can fail when you do the status quo. If you do come in and do everything the way everybody's been doing it, even if it takes forever and what you produce isn't that good, nobody really complains because you're doing it the way everybody's been doing it. When you come in and say, oh, we're going to do it all this way, well, you better be successful. So that's ultimately what you have to do. You have to be successful. God, I rambled a lot there. Thanks, very nice talk. Um, so the, uh, I've heard a lot about, well, we've heard a lot about testing today. And yeah, I probably chose the wrong topic, actually. <laughs> no, 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 it, it, it's been quite, quite good. But one thing I haven't heard very much about, um, and you mentioned a little bit at the beginning, uh, is the idea of, yeah, none of us can write bug-free code, or at least very few of us can write bug-free code. But there are certain practices and language features that help eliminate classes of bugs. And one of those is what you showed with this acyclic yeah. program. I'm just curious if you guys employ any, any other practices or you use other language features. Yeah, so um, we're starting to get, so um, we used to use CLIN. Now we're starting to look at, the, at Clang's tools for looking at different types of code, um, um, code correctness. We use PyLint pretty, pretty regularly. Those obviously aren't, I mean, they're, they're looking, you know, they're looking at certain things for standard compliance. That's a little different than what I'm talking about here, obviously, um, but still nonetheless represent good practices. One of our standard mechanisms for doing is we always, for example, when we compile, we use pedantic and, and minus w all. 
that's just a standard practice for everything we do. So we try not to, we try to be very rigorously standard conformant. I think that's one of the best things. That's actually a really good point. I didn't talk about that at all here. Um, being rigorously standard compo um, compliant, I think, is, is absolutely indispensable. When you start using extensions provided by different compilers, um, it, you can get yourself into trouble very, very quickly. I think that happens a lot more on the Fortran side because the Fortran standards tend to be a little bit more squishy over time. And you know, certain compilers say, well, this is 2003, and you know, this one's 95, and this one's working on 2018, or whatever it is. You know, so it's, it's, they always seem to be in a slightly more state of flux about what different compilers uh, support. Um, you can, like I said, Clang is coming out with a whole suite of nice tools to, to look at like code correctness. I have only started playing with those fairly recently. Um, but I'm a big, uh, Clang has been a really good um, compiler for looking at things like rigorous language adherence and also giving you really good um, descriptive output when you're straying away from it, which uh, GCC did not used to use until they recently stole Clang's front end. So, um, so in any case, those things are things that we do use. We haven't used too much beyond that at this point. Um, other than our just standard on our standard testing framework, but uh, one more statement about about uh, standard compliance and just language. Um, another thing we found to be very useful um, is we try to know where the bleeding edge of a language standard is. So, for example, right now we're we're rigorously C plus plus eleven, um, and that's actually one of the things we unit test. By the way, we have a whole bunch of tests for C plus plus eleven features that we use. And um, that way we can test if a given compiler on a given platform is truly C++11 conformant. We have not moved to C++14 yet because the difference in, in um, adoption by different compilers is still all over the map. So we found for a lot of the production code stuff that we're doing, it's best to go know where the bleeding edge is and then walk back about 10 paces. Just because if you, uh, if you sit too close on that edge, you're gonna, you know, you just inevitably are gonna have porting problem. And I say this specifically um, with this community involved because we're talking about HPC computing. HPC computing is always gonna be a little bit the Wild West. Whenever a new machine gets put on the floor, you won't believe some of the stuff you're gonna see. Um, back in 2002, I think it was 2002, um, we put the very first C plus, or you know, my, me and my team put the very first C++ application on um, ASCII White, which was the big IBM, just delivered IBM um, machine at, uh, at Lawrence Livermore. And it took me about a month and a half to actually get the code compiled. And it, it rigorously compiled with GNU. Every C++ compiler out there, it worked fine. Um, but the, the IBM, is anybody here from IBM? Okay, um, I had to make sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we were using the Visual Age compiler, and uh, and because of nicely because of unit tests, I actually got it down to one file that was ultimately after working through many other things. And if I change the order of two includes in the standard library, then the code compiled, you know. And it was like working through stuff like that all over the place. So I mean, you know, if you're in an HPC environment, I, I highly recommend not sitting right on the bleeding edge of any of these tech. You want to be there. You want to know what's there. But you just need to, you need to be careful or else you, you can end up with lots of, lots of heartache, for sure. I hope that answered your question a little bit, at least. Yeah, thanks. Any additional questions? OK. Um, so my question had to do with someone coming from outside, contributing to a code base that mm -hmm. was already 600,000, 700,000 lines long. How important is it for that person to go line by line, understand the nuances of the code and all the different types of unit testing, yeah. bef and before starting to actually contribute to that code, That's versus just starting to write code, see where the, the bug happens, and then debug from there? So. So that's a really good point. So one of the things that we try to do when we bring people onto our team early on, um, we have this option because it's pretty rigorously object oriented. What we usually try to do is find a place where they can start with not having to worry about the rest of the code at large. You know, so for example, um, we have uh, an example here is we have many geometry packages that all conform to a geometric API. 
right, so that can plug into our application so that we can transport particles on all sorts of different geometric representations. So we brought a, a new person in not that long ago, and the first thing we had them do was, was implement this new geometric implementation. They didn't have to worry about how the transport was being done. They just had to understand that API, right, and then code down from there. And then the other thing that was very nice is because they had these other geometric implementations and could just look at the tests for those without having to see how it was interacting with the rest of this massive, massive application. It was much, actually much easier for them to just go in and say, oh, if I, you know, if I write this, I can see how this API works because I can follow this 100 line unit test. So they're not worried about, you know, they can see how something works in a 100 line test instead of seeing how it works in a 600,000 line application. So actually we find to make it a lot easier to, uh, to bring in. Now that's just how we do it. You know, we try not to drop somebody right into the middle of the ocean, right? Just because it, you know, and then after they learn that and, and then they kind of learn our process and then we bring them up into other areas. You know, and obviously you can only manage complexity so far. So at some point, you know, you're gonna end up in the middle of the ocean, but we try to let you at least wade in from the beach and keep the sharks out of the way. Let's thank our speaker. Thanks.